Uh, aerosol are weird. Um, they don't behave like larger objects. Uh, for example, they can remain suspended in the air for minutes, hours, days even. And yet we know when we inhale aerosol, a significant portion deposits in our lungs. And like, why? What changes? What is it about the air being in the lungs that causes them to deposit? So in this video, I'm going to go over how aerosol deposits in the lungs and really go into some of the misunderstandings I think people have with this process and how a lot of these misunderstandings have led people not to understand essentially how masks work. Where an aerosol lands in the respiratory system will affect how the body responds. For example, aerosol that contains microbes might deposit on the surface of the throat where they could readily cause an infection. Now, if the aerosol were to deposit in the nose instead, perhaps the mucus in the nose could physically stop the infection from occurring. Okay, so consider pharmaceutical aerosol. Pharmaceutical aerosol can be designed to deposit in the upper airways, where it can relax the smooth muscle of the respiratory tract. Now, once deposited, they will help make it easier to breathe. But if the pharmaceutical aerosol deposits in the different region of the lungs, the desired benefits may be lessened or even non-existent. Okay, now consider particulate air pollution. Now, it may deposit deep within the lungs, where it can cause a series of adverse health effects, including arrhythmia, heart attack, and stroke. Now, if the air pollution were to deposit higher in the airways, they can be trapped in the mucus and then transport the cilia out of the airways to the throat where it can be swallowed and digested in the stomach. This significantly reduces the adverse health effects. Okay, so collectively what this means is that both where the air cells deposit in the body and the composition of the air cell itself will have a profound effect on how the body responds. And so what this means is it's really important to understand where an air cell is deposited in the body following inhalation. And so to better understand that, we have to have a good idea of what the structure of the respiratory system looks like. The nose, mouth, and throat are referred to as the exothoracic region. Essentially, it's the area outside of a person's core. Now, in the thoracic region, the airways within the core of the body begin to split into smaller fractions. Between the throat and the alveolar sacs, which is where the oxygen is transferred into the blood, the airways are split 23 times. Now, the size of the airways after each split get progressively smaller, such that the deepest regions of the lungs, the diameter of the airways is about 200 microns, which is about double to triple of that of a human hair. Now, for context, the size distribution of exhaled aerosol, which is the aerosol that carries infectious virus, is much smaller, around 0.5 to 5 microns. Now, this makes sense since the aerosol produced in the lungs, and is, if it was larger than the airway, it simply would not be exhaled. Now, given the extraordinary number of times the airway splits, the surface area in the lungs ends up being roughly that of a tennis court. Uh, for Americans, that's about half the size of an NBA court. And it is this large surface area that allows for the effective transfer of oxygen into and CO2 out of the bloodstream. All right, so there's this idea out there that because of the structure of the lungs, with its series of ever-shrinking branches, that the lungs are actually a lot like a series of filters, from larger to smaller. And there's this rule of thumb that the largest aerosol deposits in the outer regions of the lung, and the smaller aerosol deposits deeper in the airways. Here's the thing. This is not how this works. Not at all. In no uncertain terms, the lungs do not act like an aerosol filter. All right. So if the lungs are in a series of filters, then where does the aerosol deposit? Again, exhaled aerosol is much smaller than the smallest airway, and, and by a lot. So why don't we just simply exhale the aerosol that we breathe in? The fact that the smallest airways are more than 10 times larger than the majority of exhaled aerosol tells us that this idea that lungs operate as some sort of like filter or net that captures aerosol is just ridiculous on its face. Okay, so then what's happening? Well, to understand this, we have to understand basically how are aerosol being deposited in the lungs. First things first, and this is important. When aerosol makes contact with the airway surface, it's deposited, period. The aerosol will not bounce or be resuspended. It's done. 
once the aerosol lands on the airway surface, is no longer an aerosol and simply becomes part of the airway fluid. All right, there are three ways that aerosol deposited in the lungs, and the size of the aerosol will determine which of these three processes is most important. Larger aerosol, so those larger than about five microns, will be deposited by impaction. Impaction is what happens when the aerosol essentially can't make the corner. <laughs> so for example, at the back of the throat, there's a 90 degree bend where a lot of the aerosol will deposit. Smokers will be familiar with this as a large portion of the uh, particulates from a puff will impact and dry at the back of the throat. As mentioned, the airways are filled with thousands and thousands of branches. And every branch, there's a chance for the aerosol to not make the corner and deposit. So that's impaction. Aerosol between 5 and 0 0.5 microns will deposit in the airways via sedimentation. Essentially, it's a combination of gravitational forces and airway resistance that will cause particulates to fall out of the air and settle on the airway surface. So for aerosol under about 0 0.5 microns, the sedimentation is not a factor as the aerosol are so small, the forces that drive sedimentation are not enough to cause the particles to deposit. Now aerosol under about 5, 0 0.5 microns are deposited in the airway via diffusion. Very small aerosol move randomly in the air. Termed Brownian motion, it's this random motion that causes these tiny particles to come into contact with the airways and deposit. The majority of the aerosol that deposits by diffusion will do so deep within the lungs. So in short, the size of the aerosol will dictate how it deposits. All right. So let's bring this all together. If we plot the percent of aerosol that deposits in the lungs as a function of size, only the largest aerosol deposits via impaction, none of the smaller aerosol will deposit via impaction, a large portion of the mid-size aerosol will deposit due to sedimentation, and the smallest size aerosol will deposit due to diffusion. None of the larger aerosol will deposit via diffusion. And when we combine them and add the deposition fraction due to each mechanism up, we get the total deposition in the lungs. The area under the black line is the percent of the aerosol that deposits in the lungs as a function of their size. This unusual shape makes sense if you understand why the aerosol deposits at different sizes. The aerosol around 0.2 microns are too small to be deposited by sedimentation and impaction, and they are too large to be deposited by diffusion, and as a result, they're just simply exhaled. We can now build upon the, this understanding of how the aerosol is deposited in the lungs and look at where the aerosol is being delivered based upon aerosol size. When we do, we get this kind of relationship. Let me walk you through it. Consider a 10 micron aerosol. All of this aerosol is deposited in the head and throat. For one micron aerosol, over 10% of this size is deposited in the alveolar region. Let me say that again. Over 10% of one micron sized aerosol will reach the deepest parts of the lungs. Likewise, for the smallest aerosol, let's say 10 nanometers in size, the majority of this aerosol is deposited in the alveolar region or the deepest region of the lungs, but not all of it. Almost 40% of the smallest aerosol is deposited in the upper airways. Okay, so what this all means is that the idea that the lungs operate as some sort of filter where only the smallest aerosol gets into the deep lungs and all the largest aerosol deposits in the upper airways is just simply not accurate. Now, if we're talking about most, like if most of the small aerosol gets into the deepest part of the lungs, that's true, and most of the larger aerosol deposits in the upper airway, and that's also true, and that's fine. But most isn't all. And this difference is absolutely critical. So where do these ideas come from? I think they come from basically trying to explain these broader scientific concepts, either across disciplines or just to a broader audience. And so it, they become these useful rules of thumb in general to try to explain these complex ideas, but they can lead to some confusion. Um, like for example, like the idea of particulate air pollution being a problem because particulate air pollution is small, and it can penetrate deep within the lungs and in doing so lead to really adverse health effects. And so if you tell people, look, the, the reason why it's so dangerous is because they're small and they all get really deep in your lungs, that's helpful, it's useful. 
Um, the problem is that when you have these general rules of thumb, is that, is that they don't inform about the underlying processes at play, and as a result, can lead to some confusion, you know, downstream and have some really some unintended consequences. Which I think brings us to the issue of masks. So there's this idea that masks act as some sort of net that catches aerosols. You know, that the aerosol that carries a virus or just the virus itself is smaller than the spaces between the fiber and the mask, that the mask will literally do nothing. In short, the perception is akin to a mask working like a net that only captures the aerosol that is larger than the distances between the fibers. Now, if this were the case, Aerosol would never deposit in the lungs since the airways are much, much larger than the virus containing aerosol. And since we know that these virus aerosols do in fact deposit in the lungs, this assertion is simply ridiculous. So then, how do mass trap aerosol? Well, shown here is the deposition fraction versus aerosol size for the simple cloth and surgical masks. And here's the deposition fraction versus size for the more efficient N95 mask. Do these graphs look familiar? They should. Here's the deposition fraction versus aerosol size for the lungs that I showed earlier. These figures are very, very similar. And the reason that these two figures are very similar is simple. The mechanism of aerosol deposition in masks and in the lungs are largely the same. Impaction, diffusion, and sedimentation. Note that masks have an added feature to increase their filtration. And for both, as soon as the aerosol contacts the surface, it sticks. So in both masks and lungs, the aerosol larger than about 0.5 microns is deposited by impaction and sedimentation, and the aerosol smaller than about 0.5 microns are deposited by diffusion, and this leads to the characteristic minimum deposition fraction of around 0.2 microns. So the physics, the weird, wonderful physics of aerosol is the same for both systems. So, as mentioned at the start of the video, uh, aerosol exposure can affect health in both positive and negative ways. It's neither bad nor good, it just is. And really, we want to understand, or really to better understand how aerosol affects human health, we have to really understand essentially where that aerosol is being deposited in the body. And additionally, by better understanding the underlying mechanisms of how aerosol deposition behaves, we can design better and more effective mitigation strategies, you know, things like better and improved masks. Um, all right, so with that, I hope you found this useful. Um, if you liked it, please like. If you wanna see more, uh, please subscribe. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below or ask me on Blue Sky and Twitter. And with that, uh, Mix has all the references that I use to make this video.